Afternoon, folks. Uh, for those of you who've jumped across from the booth, um, thanks for coming back. To those who are joining in for the first time, um, I'm Ronald Watson. I'm uh, Director of Sales for Kilkerran. Finlay Ross is our Director of Production for Kilkerran. And the two of us are pretty much just having a nice wee Saturday afternoon blether about Kilkerran whiskey, the whiskies that we bottle, how they're produced and pretty much anything else that's going on. Um, and yeah, we've, we've got a few different drams that we're working our way through it Saturday afternoon. Why wouldn't you? Um, and as we go through them, we'll talk a little bit um, about each one and the makeup and some general uh, stories and information about Kilkerran. So if at any point anybody's got any questions, don't hesitate to fire them at us and we'll do our best to come up with some form of coherent answer. Uh, but the kind of place to, to start with Kilkerran, and those of you who were in the booth earlier will probably f uh, find this familiar because we spent about 20 minutes speaking about it, but uh, Kilkerran kind of, in terms of its whiskies, really begins with the 12-year-old. That's the the core of the distillery. It's the, the whiskey that was, uh, was what the guys who did the first distillations, Frank McCarty and his team, who kind of set up Glengyle Distillery, um, had a 12-year-old whiskey in mind when they designed and built the distillery itself. Um, and so everything we've been doing over the, the years since the distillery was opened in 2004, the character of the whiskey we produced, the, the casks we filled, the, the maturation and all the rest of it was all kind of geared up to the, the production of Kilkerran 12. And I'm sure some of you will have uh, hopefully tried it before, some may be getting into it for the first time. But uh, I think for us, certainly for me, the 12 year old Kilkerran is a really good intro to the Campbelltown style. Uh, you know, the, the distillery is located in the middle of town. It's a few hundred yards along the road from our sister distillery at Springbank. Uh, it's not a million miles away from uh, Glen Scotia, the, the third distillery in Campbelltown. Um, and the distillery was, was built in 2004, for anyone who, who maybe isn't aware. Um, and yeah, as I say, it's a slightly, you know, one of the obvious questions we always get asked is how does Kilkerran compare to Springbank? Because it's the same company, the same owner, Headley Wright is the chairman of the company that owns both distilleries. He's the great, great grandson of the founder of Springbank Distillery. So uh, all part of the same family of distilleries, family of companies. Um, and the question we always get is how does Kilkerran compare to Springbank? What's the difference? That kind of stuff. Um, and I think uh, from my perspective, the... 12-year-old Kilkerran is very much a Campbelltown whiskey in style. It has a light peatiness, a very gentle brininess. It's a, quite an oily dram. It's got real mouthfeel and body and texture to it, but it doesn't punch you in the face the way some of the, the Springbank whiskies sometimes can. And if a punch in the face can ever be a good thing, then certainly the Springbank 10 is a good punch in the face. Kilkerran 12 is slightly different, and maybe Finlay will give us a wee insight into into why that's different, what you know, what he sees as the difference um, between Kilkerran and Springbank. Thanks, Ronald. Yeah, so for those of you that are that went in the booth and have switched over, um, this all sounds reasonably familiar, but I don't think it's ever bad to, to talk again about Kilkerran and the style and the nature of it. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, in terms of a kind of go to dram, if I have people visiting, Quite often I'll, I'll choose the Kilkerran 12 year old over the Springbank 10, especially if they aren't too familiar with the Campbelltown style as a whole. Because I just feel it's a little bit of a, um, a softer introduction, but with it being that little bit lighter, a little bit less peaty, I would say overall, but still retaining that peat brine, the oiliness that Ral talked about, but being more bourbon influenced, having that kind of lighter uh, fruity character. I think it's a great uh, introduction to the, the style that, that's generally produced down here in Campbelltown. Um, and it's a really good uh, kind of representation of the new make spirit as well. Uh, I think we chatted before about it being the majority of it is, is bourbon cask in terms of the recipe. So about 77% uh, give or take it, it, bourbon cask, the rest in, in sherry. Um, and I think that that really helps to, to promote and highlight the characteristics of the new make spirit, um, which are that little bit lighter, a little bit fruitier. Um, Springbank and, and Springbank 10. It's a little bit of a, um, it's just a kind of punch in the face, a bit more of a robust dram. Uh, the peatiness is a little bit further forward. There's a little bit more um, a 
uh, going on in the background, uh, certainly, uh, that, that, you know, isn't always the, the easiest entry level to a Campbelltown dram for everyone. And I say that as somebody who absolutely loves Springbank 10 year old and thinks it's a, a fantastic whiskey. I but... thought you were going to say you say that as somebody who's from Oban. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll stay away from that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, generally speaking, you know, the, the, the Coquerin you make spirit. Um, is, is significantly different to the Springbank new mix spirit mm -hmm. and anybody's ever smelt the two of them side by side would attest to that um, and, and my favourite thing about how Kilkerrin is presented is that it, it retains that at its heart all the way through through any maturation but particularly through uh, bourbon maturation Yeah I think that's that's you know, a good point I spoke a bit about this earlier on and we speak about it quite a lot but the fact that the majority of whisky that comes out of Glengyle distillery uh, that we're bottling at the moment has a very heavy bourbon cask maturation focus to it and that allows the character of the spirit that Finlay talks about that kind of nice light fruity style with a bit of a camp you know with a Campbelltown accent if you can put it that way does come through all the way through that maturation and yeah we've got some Kilkerrin maturing in fresh Oloroso sherry some refill all are also sherry and that makes up part of what goes into the 12 year old but the overwhelming majority of the whiskey as Finn says three quarters of this whiskey is mature in bourbon casks you get that distillery character coming through quite nicely and from my perspective anyway if you've got a distinct style and if you make a spirit that you like then absolutely bottle it like this from bourbon casks so that that style comes through you know nothing wrong with a good sherry cask matured whiskey and we do some of that with Kilkerrin as well but the actual distillery style is so well represented in the 12 year old that you know I, I don't think we'd ever want to do it another way um it's just a, a lovely dram fruity sweet I find a maltiness with Kilkerrin um and a nice uh, that oily kind of texture uh, that really it's you know it's not necessarily a gentle dram. I think some some of what we were talking about maybe comes across as it being a really light, really fruity type of dram, which it is, but light and fruity for a Campbelltown, mm -hmm. because Campbelltown, you know, sure most most people who are tuning into something like this and, and virtually attending a whiskey event, will will be reasonably aware of Campbelltown's place in the whiskey world, but. You know, we are a region in our own right. We fought long and hard to secure that. We basically built a distillery to cement Campbelltown's place as a whisky region. Um, and as an area, you know, home to three distilleries, Springbank, Glengyle, Glen Scotia. Um, the whiskies from our part of the world, we're a, we're a wee town. There's only five or 6,000 folk who live here. We bring in some folk from time, time to time to bolster the population. Um, but the whiskies from this area are very distinctive and getting that to come through in your bottled dram is uh, is pretty important. Uh, the, the name Kilkerrin um, reflects where it's made. Kilkerrin is the anglicisation of the old uh, Scottish Gaelic name for Campbelltown. So way back when, before the, the Campbell clan kind of invaded I suppose and took over Campbelltown and decided to name it after themselves. Campbelltown was known as Kinloch Kilkerrin which means the town at the head of the loch of the church of St Kieran. So St Kieran came over from Ireland sort of formed a religious cell here which became known as Kinloch Kilkerrin. Um, so Kilkerrin being the, the anglicisation of that. We um, The naming of our whiskey is, is pretty interesting because it's distilled at Glen Gyle Distillery, but it's called Kilkerrin Single Malt. And the reason for that is that the name Glen Gyle is trademarked by another company who uh, who used to, I don't know if they still do, but they used to do a whiskey under that label, a blended malt, I think. Uh, so when we announced back in 2000 and 2001, around about that time, that we planned to rebuild Glengyle Distillery, because it was one of Campbelltown's original distilleries, closed down in 1925, um, lay not even so much empty or dormant, basically all the distilling equipment was uh, removed back in the, the 20s and 30s. 
Uh, but in the year 2000, the, the chairman of Springbank, Headley Wright, decided he wanted to build another distillery in Campbelltown in order to cement its place as a whisky region. There was some chat going around in those days that um, Campbelltown only had two distilleries and so therefore shouldn't be classed as a whisky region. And so Headley Wright and the company set about doing what they could to change that. And so the, the rebirth, the rebuilding of Glengyle Distillery was the, the step that was taken. Uh, to to do that, and so you know, Glengyle Distillery was founded by a guy called William Mitchell, who is Headley Wright's great great uncle. I think I'm right in saying certainly one of the greats in amongst it. Um, and so it was one of the the Mitchell family distilleries. Um, and so Mr. Wright decided he was going to build uh, buy the buildings of the old distillery and build a new distillery within it. So it opened in in 2004, but we had this issue with the name because the the name Glengyle is trademarked by another company who wanted more money than we were willing to spend to transfer the name. So uh, Headley Wright decided that rather than buying the name, he didn't really like it anyway. So although the distillery is called Glengyle, he chose the name Kilkerran for the whiskey to reflect the Campbelltown nature of it. It's the distillery that not quite put Campbelltown back on the map, but made sure we weren't falling off the map. Uh, so the name kind of reflects that. Um, entirely, um, which is yes, yeah, as you also wouldn't fit Kinloch Kilkerran <laughs> on a label, so it's easier just to go with Kilkerran, um, and so that's that's what was done. Uh, but we're actually again, those of you who followed the story for a number of years probably know that our production levels are quite small at the distillery in Finlay, and maybe give us more of an insight into that. Um, you know, for the first few years of its, its existence, we only really distilled whiskey at Glengyle Distillery for about six weeks of the year. We borrowed the staff from Springbank, uh, moved them 400 yards along the road to Glengyle and uh, got them to do some production there. We've increased that a little bit now, um, but we've not, not distilled a massive amount um, from the distillery, but we are actually working there at the moment. Um, and maybe Finley could give us an insight into some sort of past past distillation levels, production levels, and, and where we are at the moment. Yeah, so I think uh, I've been here just about five years now. Uh, when I first started, as Ronald describes there, it was really a, a core production team that worked at Springbank um, and at Glengyle and in the Maltings. So we essentially worked on a, a cycle. You know, for a certain amount of the year, the guys would make malt to fill the bins. Once the bins were filled, that malt would then be used for distillation at Springbank and Glengyle, and that was really the the deciding factor on how much could be produced uh, within a year. Uh, over the last five years, we've made some incremental changes to try and increase production. So the first thing was to uh, bring in a team to be trained to purely be a malting team to allow us to free up our stillmen to spend some of their time at Springbank and some of their time at Glengyle. And so as, as uh, you can probably imagine, um, you can't learn the skills that are required to make malt or distill Springbank or uh, the still up at Glengyle overnight. So that took some time before we got to a position where we had uh, a production team that allowed the flexibility to essentially make malt all year round and then split the, the rest of the production between Springbank and Glengyle. So just now we spend about 12 weeks uh, up at Glengyle Distillery. As Ronald mentioned, uh, we're up there just now. So generally speaking, come sort of mid to late September, we'll make the move from Springbank up to Glengyle we produce up there for 12 weeks and that'll take us right the way through until the, the company wide shut down just before Christmas. Uh, prior to that, it's, it's all uh, production up at Springbank. So in the time that I've been here, we've increased production up at Glengyle from about 55,000 uh, litres of alcohol up to about 92,000 now, uh, which is a significant increase in terms of a percentage. But uh, in terms of weeks, you know, we've maybe gone from about <laughs> six, seven to, to 12. Uh, so it's, it's a conversation that myself and Ronald have a lot. We would love to, to spend more time at Glengyle to, to be producing more up there, but it's a constant balance between um, you know making sure that we're producing enough Springbank, enough at Glengyle, making sure the Maltons are attended to. Um, and as I mentioned before, we can't just uh, make people as skilled as we require them to be overnight. It takes a long time uh, for somebody to learn how to do any aspect of the, the production. Uh, we, we normally think about kind of six months as a basic training, but uh, there's guys that have worked here for, for 30 years that would still tell you that they're discovering new things and mm. trying to master master others. So it's not really something that ever gets signed off and, and that's you, you're, you're 
completely done uh, in that regard. Yeah, so from a production point of view, um, uh, I always love when we go up to Glengale because it's the, the kind of transition from summer into autumn. Uh, the guys are usually a little bit hot when they first go up there because you get, quite often get the tail end of the nice September weather. <laughs> then by the time the middle of December comes around, they're absolutely delighted that they're either standing over a, a roasted hot mash tun or a couple of really warm stills. Uh, the thing that we can never avoid in terms of temperature is the the filling store essentially a, a you know an, an outbuilding attached to the, the distillery <laughs> itself with a plastic corrugated roof uh so we did our first filling of the year last week and uh, the temperatures were kind of unseasonably cold i would say for this time of year um and even then it isn't even a a remote comparison to what it's like in the middle of december when you've got about 18 layers of clothes on and you can see your breath in there and the guys are just running around in order to keep warm and, and move things about. Uh, but yeah, uh, in terms of production up at, at Glengyle, as Ryan mentioned before, a really distinct and interesting um, new mix spirit, definitely uh, completely separate, but with some similar characteristics to, to Springbank 10 year old. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll do a variety of different things up there. The main thing that we're doing is producing uh, cocaine a 12 year old uh, we'll come on to the heavily peated a little bit later that we've got here but we'll spend about three weeks of the year producing heavily peated and then there's a couple of little experimental things that we spend a week each of doing that uh, we'll no doubt tell you all about in the future but not for today <laughs> no i mean yeah that's the thing you know you've got and still a relatively new distillery albeit one that's 16 years old but it's um it's a bit of a blank canvas you know and you know Finley and the team and we, we like to yeah, do a bit of experimentation you know we, we all represent both sides of our company if you like old traditional hands-on 100% in Campbelltown production at Springbank and that will never ever change um, but with a new distillery you do get that bit of a blank canvas and we've got now a very well established spirit a very well established style of whiskey so given that kind of extra production that we're now doing, um, it gives us a bit of room to try some different things um, to see, you know, so, so yeah, yeah, probably 80 or 90% of what we distill is double distilled, peated to about 12, or made from malt that's peated to about 12 to 15 ppm. Um, and that's what makes up the bulk of our production. But there's room within that to try some heavily peated. That was an experiment that went really well. Maybe we should try some unpeated for different distillation methods and see see what effect it has. You know, why why not? Um, you know, we've we've got a team of guys who uh, who are you know trained and qualified, and you know they know what their way around the distillery. They're very good at what they do. So let them spread their wings a little bit and try some different stuff as well. Is is no bad thing um, because we have enough whiskey just from the past that lets us develop a core of what we're doing. So the 12 year old, as we've talked about at length, has been the kind of core product from Kilkerran over the last four years. Uh, we're now about to kind of hit the world with the 16 year old Kilkerran, which is so new it doesn't even have a proper bottle yet. But um, it's a, an extension and I suppose an expansion in the 12, not just in time, but the way the flavours have uh, come to pass from that as well. Um, what's the maturation in this, Finley? Uh, it's almost entirely bourbon matured. There's a little bit of um, of refill uh, cask influence there, but it's it's so small that I always feel that this is pretty much a purely bourbon driven whiskey, uh, which, as we talked about before, is no bad thing, uh, given how well we've seen Kilkenna mature within bourbon casks over mm -hmm. the years. You touched on it before, you know, it's, it's four years down the line from the 12 year old, and um, it's, it's definitely got the, the same DNA, the same characteristics all the way through, but it's it's really distinct and it's really interesting to try Kilkerran at this age, um, as, as we touched on before. With a new distillery, you are the first people that are trying the 12 year old, the 16, you know, in uh, however many years time when we try the, the different older uh, versions of what we've produced there. So you get to see this evolution and, and change of, of how the spirit works. And given that the 12 year old is so good, I think we always felt that longer in the cask and getting older would produce something that was really good but also really distinct and interesting and i don't think we've come across anything to disavow us of of that notion as no of yet. no absolutely um we've had 
the first question of the session, at least the first question that Nathan's chosen to share with us anyway, um, and it's very production related. Finley, excuse me looking at my phone, but we've got Nathan over here, kind of man in the fort, texting me the questions that you guys are asking because I don't have a computer screen in front of me. But Stuart Heaney, he says, what are the main challenges for the staff in swapping between the distilleries and how does the process differ? Which is a very, very pertinent question because we've just made that change over the, over the last kind of month. And I'm not going to speak for Finlay, but I would imagine he'll tell us that the challenges are pretty significant in some ways, <laughs> while in others, not so difficult. So. Yeah, I think, great question. Um, I think in terms of production at Springbank, and I'll touch about it before, it's uh, uh, the old distillery, really traditional in the way it's been done. Things have probably evolved there that you might not design from scratch. <laughs> so uh, you, you'll find that there's like mad dashes to go from one valve to another, or upstairs to downstairs. Um, the guys are really kept on their toes at Springbank in terms of just what they've got to keep their eyes on in the area across uh, you know, that, that spread. With regards to going up to Glengyle, um, and it's a real testament to, to the design of the place and, and, and how Frank envisioned it, it's almost entirely on one level and flows from the start of the production in terms of your, your malt intake right the way through um, to mashing, fermentation, and then distillation at the end. So it's a very linear process. Uh, everything's sort of self-contained. Uh, Everything flows in a very logical manner. So from that point of view, um, you would you'd maybe say that the, the technical challenges of running Glengyle are slightly less than at Springbank. Where the challenge is really coming up at Glengyle is the fact that uh, for eight months of the year, nobody's <laughs> doing any production up there. So how do you keep a distillery that is only operating you know, 12 weeks of the year in tip-top condition so that it's almost ready to switch back on again when you move up there? And the answer is uh, a lot of hard work. And even that means that uh, you're almost entirely certain to come back up to Glengyle and encounter some kind of issue. So even though we keep on top of everything as, as best we can, there really isn't uh, any kind of simulation of production and the equipment always works best when it's working constantly um, and doing what it's supposed to be doing. So I don't think it's any great secret that uh, the washbacks are something we've had a, a great deal of issue with over the years. Uh, the, the Siberian large washbacks, they love just getting that cycle through of um, uh, Water coming through at about 16 to 18 degrees, then going through its fermentation profile, which takes it up to about 34, dropping back down again to about 22 before we pump it, getting hosed out, getting a steam clean. All of that means that the, the equipment is kept in tip top shape, and it means that the wood is allowed to um, operate under conditions which keep it sealed and keep it healthy. When you're not using it for eight months, uh, what you need to do is fill it up with water uh, to keep it nice and swelled and, and watertight. But you also can't leave it under uh, water for too long because you start to get conditions that are, uh, you know, promote the, the rotting of the wood or leakage or anything like that. So they have to be dropped. Um, so really, we aren't able to simulate production up at Glengyle in any way that's compatible to how it would be used. So invariably, when we go back up to Glengyle in September, there's always something, um, whether it's the malt take running a lot slower than, malt intake, sorry, uh, running a lot slower than we'd expect or whether it's uh, the fact that the mash year didn't work on the <laughs> first mash of the year. And it's probably, I think I'm right in saying it's a, it's a different issue every time. You know, if you just knew that the malt intake would run slowly for the first few weeks, that's fine, you could allow for it. If you <laughs> you certainly wouldn't allow for your mash time not working properly, but uh, you know, another one this year, was it the steam coils weren't um, heating up as efficiently or speaking to Robert up in production the other day, and, he was saying that the, the spirit was coming off the still much more slowly than it would normally do, um, which is, again, just a, a kind of teething problem. But if, if we were a, a distillery or a company run with efficiency particularly in mind, then the way we run Glengyle would be seen as bonkers. Uh, but we're not. You know, we're there to make the best whiskey that we can, ideally employ as many people as we can to do it as well. And so you kind of take these little eccentricities and inefficiencies and things that, you know, in an accountant's world, you would never tolerate it. But in ours, it's just part of the story. It's part of what goes on. And yeah, if you get slightly different characteristics every time you distill because of it or whatever, 
so be it. You know, we're we're happy to kind of work with that and embrace it. We'll probably keep a note that you know this year the spirit came off a bit slower for the first couple of weeks, and we'll keep an eye on the casks that that spirit's gone into, just to see if there's any difference, if that has made an effect. Um, or not, and we'll if we can taste it, then that's fine. We'll maybe keep that batch separate and do something different with it. Um, if it doesn't, then fine, all well and good. You know, things like that affect your yield quite dramatically. How much uh, spirit you get from every ton of malt that you use, but we keep a record of our yield because you have to, but not necessarily because oh my god, the yield's low. We better get more efficient during malting or whatever, but. You know, you, you kind of do it the way you decide to do it and get the the result that you get. We do, we don't, you know. I'm I'm sure there are things we could do to be a bit more efficient, but we're not really that worried. <laughs> um, as long as we're making a good quality, good character um, spirit, then that's pretty much the whole thing, really, as as it should be. You know, it's all about what makes it to the bottle and what makes it to somebody's glass. Um, Everything else round about it is kind of for other folk to worry about, really. Um, we, we, we come up with the good stuff, we bottle it, and we try and bring it to everybody. And I think, to kind of loosely bring that back a bit, the 16-year-old is an absolutely tremendous dram. Um, it turns 16 what, in the summer, roughly, due, some point during lockdown anyway. Who, who knows when that actually was? But the, the whiskey turned 16 earlier this year. And we've not had a lot of opportunity to try it. So this is probably only maybe the fourth or fifth time I've had a dram in that 16-year-old. And it's absolutely glorious. It's, yeah. it's tremendous. It's still got a bit of that Campbelltown character to it, that little bit of that robust maritime style. But the fruitiness and the sweetness that you find in the 12 are just extended into the 16. It's, it's it, ah, glorious is, is the word I would use for it. I think that's, that's brilliant. So th this will be... Due for bottling, I think either late this month, early next month, so should be around in the UK at least, um, this side of Christmas, definitely. Uh, there's not a huge amount of it available, unfortunately. Finley spoke a bit about production levels, but they, you know, there should be enough around it if you want to get a bottle and you you know, you know the usual kind of retailers, independent specialist places. It's not going to be in the supermarkets or the airports, that's for sure. Um, you know, you, you'll hopefully be able to track one down. Because it's uh, ah, it, it's a good one. If, if you like Kilkerran, if you like the character of the distillery, then ah, this this is right uh, right up your street, I would say. Yeah, I just having a taste of it again there. That that kind of juiciness and fruitiness mm -hmm. is really accentuated, and it's just really interesting to to try it at sixteen years old and and see how it has matured and progressed. Yeah. Um, I, it, it's, I mean, this, this would do, you know, I don't really need to drink anything else. We've got some other fine drams here that I will certainly partake of. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, this, this, is, this is great. You know, the, the 12's a brilliant dram. 16, didn't expect anything less, but uh, it's, it's cracking. Really, really nice. Um, uh, so I guess, I say, bottled, bottled in a few weeks' time, be out in uh, not too distant future. 46% it's going to be bottled at. Like everything else, no artificial colour, no gel filtration. Um, and yeah, cracking. Um, I might be first in the queue to buy a bottle, I have to say. <laughs> I, I put just a wee splash of water in that. I, I don't always drink my whiskey with water. If I'm trying something new or something I'm not that familiar with, I'll always try it neat and then try it with a bit of water. And I've put just a wee splash in that, and it, it, I, it gets even better, funnily enough. Um, I find a lot of whiskies can go a little bit flat if you put too much water in them, but this one, ju just a touch. And it's great, the maltiness, that fruitiness. There's a, there's a nice kind of dryness in the finish yeah. that I don't think you get with the 12-year-old. Um, it's just a little bit dry and dry. Just just that, tremendous. Um, What's your impression of the, the peat difference between the 16 and the 12? I think, I think the peat is, I mean, peat's at 12 to 15 ppm. It's not, Kilkerran's never a heavily peated whiskey. Or standard Kilkenny's never a heavily peated. The one we call heavily peated is heavily peated, funnily enough. But um, the twelve, it's the peat's there. It's part of it. I think by the time we're getting to sixteen, the peat's pretty mellow. Yeah. And before I put the water in, I didn't get that much peat. And what I think, I think that's maybe that kind of dryness in the finish I'm getting is possibly a bit peaty as well. Yeah, I think it just becomes a an overall component of the mm -hmm. whiskey um, on a low level. So it's, yeah. it's always there, but I, I would tend to agree with you that 
sort of finish that isn't the fruity and juiciness, it is a little bit dry. I think that's that kind of smoky dryness from yeah. the heat that's, that's promoting that. And it's not massively apparent in the nose, at least not to me. It's no. right at the end. You know, and even you put that first taste of that, I'm, I'm getting aye, this, this kind of juicy, fruity, like almost like chewy sweeties kind of thing, that, that level of fruitiness, that level of sweetness. Um, and then it's in the finish, you're starting to get that slightly dry, that slightly peaty style. Um, and I, I think you were spot on that it's part of the dram. I wouldn't describe this as a peaty whiskey, but it's definitely a whiskey that's got peat in it. Yeah. Um, but it is a component. It's not the overwhelming part of the dram. We'll, we do that in another way. Um, could we absolutely part you about the face with it? <laughs> but um, this, this is... I, um, the peat's there, the sweetness is there, the fruitiness is there, the maltiness is there. There's a kind of coffee, honey, caramel kind of thing going on as well. Um, just really, really nice. And I'm slightly aware that we're on a, a time frame and there's also some other nice drams, so I'm going to try one of them as well. This one is really something that's uh, that we've really we've, we've kind of put it out for the, the event this weekend basically because we like it and we can. Um, it's nothing, something that we don't have any direct plan for bottling or anything at the moment. It's uh, a, another 16-year-old Kilkerran, but this one uh, was originally matured in the Madeira cask. Um, it was one of that kind of parcel of casks that we filled during the first, or after the first production run at the distillery. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys have owned or obtained or have seen the kind of set we did, the, the first six casks to be filled were all six different cask types. So a bourbon, a rum, an Oloroso, a Madeira, Fino and a port cask. Um, and we sold, or pre-sold I suppose, bottles from those casks right at the very beginning. You know, new distillery needs some money, you've not got any actual whiskey to sell. Um, so we kind of said, you know, we, we would produce these sets when they were 10 year old. We invited people to, to buy in nice and early. Um, and so, in addition to each of the casks that were filled and bottled at 10 years old, we actually had to fill more than one, because if you're saying, you know, right, here's our first six casks, people buy the bottles, that's fine. What if you get to 10 years old and it's leaked, it's empty, and you've got nothing left to bottle? So we actually had to fill two of each cask type. Uh, so the first six, thankfully, all came to fruition as we intended, and that left us uh, with six kind of backup casks. So this is one of the, the few remaining backups that are there. Um, so it was in Madeira for 10 years. And then when these casks all got bottled um, at 10 years old, we obviously tasted through them and all the rest of it. And it was quite apparent that the ones that were in the alternative casks, the port, the Madeira, the rum, had had enough maturation in those cask types. We didn't want to mature them on beyond the 10 years in, in their original cask. So we transferred what we had left into refill bourbon barrels, so as neutral a cask as we could find, because we liked the flavor, but we weren't, you know, we weren't planning on bottling them anytime soon. We'd already done the 10 year old set. So we put the whiskey into refill bourbon and just let it carry on gently. So this spent 10 years in a Madeira cask and has spent subsequently six years in a bourbon cask. So technically it's a bourbon finish. And if any of you have seen some of the single cask Kilkerrans that we bottled um, within the last few months, last year or so, um, they all had that element to them. They were the, the remnants, I suppose, of that first six casks. And it's it's probably pretty odd to do a secondary maturation in bourbon, but that, that's how it played out. And it gives us some some cracking drams. I, I love a Madeira cask influence on the whiskey. I've got a really sweet tooth. And I don't know about you, Finley, but the sweetness in this is like just, yeah, pretty, pretty mega, pretty yeah. big. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, just from a in the production point of view, that almost reversal of what you might expect in terms of rather than having its main maturation in refill bourbon and giving it two or three years or whatever in Madeira to give it a hit, flipping it around, it's been really interesting to, to taste the casks. So um, for a long time, we had a number of these casks as part of our warehouse tasting that I used to host in, in warehouse number three. And for things like port, as you mentioned before, you know, 10 years can quite often be enough, depending on how it's gone, and it maybe starts to get overdrived and over mm -hmm. at that stage. And um, less so with the Madeira, but it can still occur. But that it kind of last 
five, six years, whatever it is, that's been in the, the refill bourbon, it's rounded out a lot of these whiskies. You know, it, it's allowed it to mature on and develop and become a, a different whiskey from the, the ones that were bottled at 10 years old. But it's also added in some vanilla, some sweetness, mm. things that have uh, given a real balance to a lot of these cast types. Um, and I think this is this is no different. It's really, it's Madeira. It's a Madeira matured yeah. whiskey, but it's not just Madeira that you're getting from that. And it's striking how different it is to the the 16 year old. You know, like, like there's there's mental stuff in here that's not in the 16. Like yeah. spicy, like what? Mega spicy. Big, big sweetness, um, which as it should be c coming from the Madeira cask, but it's um, it, it's interesting because the Kilkerran character is still there to a, an extent, but it's not as typically Kilkerran as the 12 and the 16, which I think speaks to the fact that the more dominant cask can overpower the character of the spirit, which is why, as we said, we stick to bourbon casks mainly for the core range or a balance of bourbons and cherries, but um, it's a nice dram, this, but I don't immediately go, oh, yeah, that's a Kilkerran. Yeah, I think it's a little bit less oily, a little bit less mm. briny than you might expect. Um, Peat-wise, again, I think it's maybe even further in the background yeah. than the, the bourbon mature. Yeah, that's right. um, it's, it's certainly, a, it is, it's a really nice dram, and it, it, it's nice to, I suppose, see the difference in the maturation profiles, you know, the no two casks are the same we're all fairly well aware of that but um yeah it, it's it, it's a different dram entirely and i think the fact that we don't do a lot of alternative cask maturation at kilkerran is noteworthy i suppose the vast majority of what we produce gets filled into probably what about 60 percent in uh, first fill bourbon give or take give yeah, or take. yeah i mean it'll vary from year, from year to year 25-30% in the first fill sherry and that leaves us with you know, 20% roughly of our production refill sherry, refill bourbon, Madeira, port but but we don't do a lot of cask experimentation as I was saying at Glengyle uh, because the character of the spirit is so distinctive that as I said earlier we don't want to drown that out um, yeah, it'll be interesting to try, and it is interesting to try Kilkerran from different cast types, but I'm not entirely convinced that um, as a blanket plan, this kind of different cast type actually enhances the whiskey. You know, w would I prefer what will be the 16 year old to this Madeira cask? Yeah, absolutely, by, you know, by a, a, a distance, uh, nothing wrong with this, but the regular 16 with that massive, almost entirely bourbon matured, and that's the way it'll be in the future, it's very, very much my style of whiskey. Um, and while it is interesting to try this from different cast types, and I think that's an interesting distinction, um, and the question we had earlier kind of pointed us in the direction of differences between Springbank and Glengyle, but the Kilkerran spirit is lighter and fruitier than the Springbank spirit, Finley explained it's noticeably different straight off the still. Springbank's a bit more robust, a bit more punchier, a bit heavier, and so maybe stands up better to alternative cast types, stronger cast types like PX Sherry or not that we do a lot of PX at Springbank, but Big Sherry's, Madeira's, Ports, whereas the Kilkerran, that lighter fruity side, maybe allows the cast to dominate a little bit, especially having had 10 years in a Madeira cask, it's certainly got that big influence. Um, so for me, we, we you know, we'll concentrate a lot on the bourbon casks from Kilkerran. Future planning, you know, we're aiming maybe to have a 20-year-old Kilkerran in four years' time if there's enough stock left after we've bottled the 16-year-old that everybody wants and needs. Um, and that we don't really plan on maturing stock beyond 20, to be honest. You know, we've got our 8-year-old cask strength, which we're going to taste in a minute, the 12-year-old 16 and 20, and then we'll have these experiments or kilkerments if you want to call them that to help kind of broaden the the, the range of whiskies available but you know I, I think that you know for the core stock um, certainly the 12 16 and probably the 20 bourbon casks are going to be where it's where it's happening um and hopefully you know i'm, I'm aware that everybody's taste is different and i'm very much talking about how much i love these things but you know 
there, there's always room to do something different, but we're aiming at this this nice bourbon cask, fruity, sweet, bit of peat, bit of spice, that kind of stuff, but we don't want one thing to overpower another. No, and I think when you can uh, create the differences just through variations of recipe or an extension of time, like between the 12 mm. and the 16, there isn't really any great driver to start messing around with different cast types or, as you say, maybe overpowering Kilkerran or moving away from, from what it is that we feel is, is really interesting and, mm. and makes Kilkerran Kilkerran. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So while that's breathing in the glass, I'm going to have a wee go at the old cast strength as well. Because I think of only this is the the up well it's the upcoming it's uh, the latest batch of eight year old cast strength Kilkerran or not the latest the next is probably the right word um, this is not going to be out until in the UK anyway till probably February um, so the 2019 bottling of eight year old cast strength we did that had a a pretty pronounced recharge sherry cask influence to it um, is. Probably one of the most intriguing Kilkerrans we've ever bottled, and it's probably fair to say it caught, pe caught people's attention in a way that no other Kilkerran we've bottled did. And that was primarily, I think, because it had this big, massive recharge sherry cask influence. It was really dark in colour. It was a big, rich, spicy, bold, you know, massively sherry whiskey um, that certainly caught people's attention. This next batch, um, certainly, will, will hopefully correct me if I'm wrong, but while this is all sherry matured again, it's not the recharged sherry element, this is all Oroso matured, I think, Finn. Yeah, that's right, a mixture of first fill and, and refill. Um, I think in terms of the, the eight-year-old cash strength, uh, we've always kind of looked to make that either one thing or the other. You know, it's yeah. either fully bourbon matured or fully sherry matured, or maybe down the line if there are enough casts or something different to experiment with, we may do that. But generally speaking, um, to have something like this, as almost a counter punch, I would say, to mm. the 12-year-olds. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Having something that is 100% sherry influenced, um, you're not going to get a direct comparison given that it's four years younger and cash strength. But uh, from a, you know, a tasting point of view, it's really interesting the, the kind of divergent paths that the bourbon cast and the sherry cast take. Mm. Uh, and, and I love just being able to, to track that and see what it's like. Um, yeah, for, for me, this is... Uh, I don't want to say properly sherried whiskey, but it's a very much a sherried whiskey. You know, I do compared to the the sixteen year old Madeira cask sample, I do get more of the Kilkerran character here, probably because it's a bit younger and the cask hasn't had as long to to work with it. But I get, I'm still getting the fruit, the the maltiness, the oiliness coming through in this. The peat, yeah, maybe when you add a drip, a drop of water. Um, I get that nice dry finish that I also found in the 16 year old. But I mean, I, you know, we, we as a company have used all the Rosso Sherry for a long, long time. Um, and I love the rich sweetness that all the Rosso gives um, without becoming the big, treacly, chewy, massive thing that certain other types of Sherry that people love to, love to use or love to taste can give i think um this level of sherry cast maturation is is just about right for me any more sherry in there might not be my style i recognize that loads of folk do like it yeah i think you and i have fairly similar tastes which is good and bad <laughs> i suppose yeah no i think with this one here um i found it really well this is terrible cliche but it is balanced you know i think that even within the the sherry influence it's balanced it's got that like kind of sweetness the spiciness the dried fruits but there's also more of that sort of um, kind of medicinal side of the mm. sherry cask as well that's coming through. And I think right at the heart of it is the Kilkerran uh, character in New Make Spirit. It's maybe more subtle, uh, but more difficult for it to really shine through in a fully sherry matured whiskey than it is one that's the majority bourbon matured. But I think the fact that we would sit there and maybe say, you know, if someone handed that to us in a tasting, uh, sitting around the office, I'm pretty sure that's Kilkerran. Yeah. Um, I think that it's really good that we've been able to uh, do something that's 100% sherry matured, offer a counter punch, offer something slightly different, but not deviate a million miles away from what the core of the distillery is about or what the new mix spirit is, mm. is there to reflect. Yeah, and this is what, 59.7%, I think it says on it. Right? Yeah. It did say until I smudged it, I've now no idea what the <laughs> it says. 
there's an eight on there somewhere, so maybe it's fifty eight percent. But let uh, so this one will be coming out in February. Obviously, we've had to kind of rejig a lot of our bottling plans and stuff off the back of COVID and a, a four, well, three and a half, four month long company shutdown that we had to keep everybody on the straight and narrow. Um, so that, this will be coming out a little bit later than normal. This would normally have came out uh, pre Christmas, but just to scheduling and all the rest of it, it'll be kind of late winter, early spring next year. Uh, but it, as I think you're dead right, the, the counterpoint angle is is exactly uh, exactly what this gives, and it's it's um, aye, it, it's nice to have that alternative. Um, and it is interesting that we may look to use the cask strength version in future for any kind of mega differences. You know, uh, we we had never really intended to bottle an eight year old cask strength. Kilkerran, you know, we being, you know, fairly relaxed about how things work. I said earlier, we were aiming at the 12 year old Kilkerran as our key product. And, you know, we, we'd done our plans and our forecasts and how much do we think we'll need and all the rest of it. And so when we first bottled the 12 year old, the first batch sold out in an instant, which is not the biggest surprise in the world because it's a new thing from the guys who also run Springbank, which is in very high demand. So the, the first one was always gonna, you know, sell pretty well. What we didn't necessarily expect was for the second batch of the 12 year old to sell like that. And there's only so much whiskey we can make available in any year based on the production figures uh, that, that Finley mentioned. And we also need, would like to mature some on to get a bit older. And so demand for Kilkerran, you know, was, was great. It was really, really positive, the feedback, on it was brilliant. Uh, we like it. I think you guys like it. So that, that was great. And so obviously at that point, we didn't have any whiskey older than 12. So we couldn't go, oh, well, we'll do the 12 year old and a 16 year old, because at that point the distillery was 12 years old, we had 12 year old whiskey. So we looked kind of back the way to see what, um, what we might bottle to go along with the 12. And we found a, almost a parcel of casks. Uh, and the first couple of batches of the, the old cask strength were fully bourbon matured, but we found this parcel of casks that uh, we thought were great. You know, they were um, 2006, 2007 maybe was their distillation, maybe 2005, can't quite remember off the top of my head. Um, but really good, really enjoyable. Like, yeah, that's fine, we'll, we'll vat these together and that'll be the eight-year-old, or, or that'll be the cask strength. And we... Uh, well, yep, that's good. That reflects everything we want it to be. It's a good dram. It's like Kilkerran. It's a bit higher strength. So it's punchier, and and that's good. And so we looked at the the dates the casks were filled, and it turned out well they were nine years old. And it was like, oh, great. Okay, so nine year old cask strength. And we thought maybe you know we'd just vary the cask strength. One year it could be nine, it could be eight, it could be seven. But um, we we were pointed by uh, by our chairman and our managing director in the direction of doing it, calling eight years old because they don't like odd numbers. So uh, so we bought the first cast strength was really nine years old. We called it eight year old. Um, this one is actually eight years old. Um, but as Finley says, it's that nice counterpoint with the sherry cask. The, uh, the cask strength gives it a point of difference as well. Obviously, it lets you guys decide how much water you want to add to your whiskey rather than us deciding for you. Um, and so we do you know, maybe 12,000 bottles of the cask strength a year. It's not a huge amount, um, but it gets it gets it out there. Um, and yeah, it's all, all good. As I, say, I'm, I said earlier, I'm more of a bourbon cask whiskey drinker, but this the balance, as Finley mentioned, is, is good enough in this one for me that I certainly don't have any, uh, any dislike to it at all. No, and I think um, she touched on before, like we tried it neat there, Adding a little bit of water and I actually think that for my taste that little bit of water has really opened it up it's maybe separated out that kind of spicy dried fruit angle mm -hmm. and medicinal angle and it's allowed them to come through at different times but uh, yeah I think you know as you mentioned we maybe do have reasonably similar tastes when it comes to tasting whiskey which is why we always get other people involved <laughs> yeah. otherwise we would just end up setting up a range that <laughs> we'd only want to buy ourselves <laughs> but something like this um, you know it's, it's maybe not the first thing I would always uh, go towards, but I think this and and the previous iteration of the the sherry uh, eight year old cast strength have both been stand out in their own right. Yeah, I mean, if if you're somebody who likes 
a sherry angle to your dram, then this this will be right in your your ballpark. I would have thought. Um, it's it's very noticeably a sherry matured whiskey, but it's still a Kilkerran, as we've mentioned, um, which which certainly can't be bad. Um, which kind of leads us on, um, I suppose, to something that is very much a Kilkerran, but it's a Kilkerran that's massively different to the normal Kilkerran that that we produce. Um, while Finley's pouring that. Um, so the vast majority of whiskey that we distill at Glengyle to, to become Kilkerran is made from barley that's peated, as I said, to 12 to 15 ppm. Uh, it's malted at Springbank on floor maltings, and it's effectively the same malt that we would use to produce Springbank whiskey. Uh, we just take it to Kilkerran. Um, and one of the differences between Springbank and Kilkerran is that the majority of Kilkerran is double distilled. Springbank's two and a half times distilled, which thankfully we won't get into because it's a <laughs> Kilkerran event. Uh, but Kilkerran is double distilled, but the majority of whiskies in Scotland is distilled in fairly tall stills, uh, which contributes to its fruity, lighter kind of character. Springbank stills are quite squat, quite dumpy. Kilkerrans are slightly taller. They're not big, long, huge swan necks, but they're they're slightly taller. The the line arm that connects the neck of the still to the condenser is at an upward angle rather than the downward one you'll see at most distilleries, which again promotes that lightness, that fruitiness. Only the lightest spirit makes it to the condenser. You get a lot of reflux, promotes the fruity flavours. Um, and so the majority of whisky distilled at Glengyle for Kilkerran is double distilled and lightly peated. Finley mentioned a bit earlier that we do some experiments, some different things. And a few years ago, uh, we decided to try making a whisky at Glengyle that was as peaty as we could do it as a company to see what would happen. At Springbank, obviously, we do Long Row, which is the peaty version, but we set out to try and make something peatier than Long Row. And we made it and we liked the new make, so we made it again every year. But we had no real plans to do anything with it for quite a while. You know, we thought maybe leave it till six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve years old, who knows? Um, and one day, I, I can't remember why, but Finlay and I had a sample of what at that point was still spirit. It was only two years old. And we tasted this heavily peated spirit. It had been made with malt somewhere up to about 80 to 85 ppm, so massively more peated than normal Kilkerran. And uh, at two years old, we, we were absolutely, and probably very pleasantly, but massively shocked at how good we found it. Yeah. Um, and that was a sample of two-year-old spirit. It was at 61%, something like that, 60.5%, 61%. But so good and so drinkable. Yeah, massively peaty, as you would have expected, but had just, yeah, youthful, but not green, not spirity, not hot. And and I, I think we, we enjoyed it so much that obviously we started to think, well, you know, that this might be ready for bottling at a relatively young age, but we didn't want to take each other's word for it. Yeah. <laughs> but that thing we have very similar tastes like we you know we like the same kind of whiskies, we like the same kind of wines, we like the same kind of beers. So you need to open that up to make sure other people are getting an input so that it's not just the, the Ranald and Finlay collection. Um so we, with that in mind we kind of set up a blind tasting amongst some of the team where we took um I can't remember maybe six, seven um, heavily peated whiskies from other distilleries that were available on the market um, and put the two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old, as it probably was by that stage, uh, heavily peated spirit in amongst it. Didn't tell anybody what we were doing. Didn't even tell anybody that there was a Kilkerran in there. And we got everybody to taste them and give their scores and all the rest of it. And at the end of the tasting, so maybe eight, I think it was eight, was it ten? Maybe as much as ten. Ten, yeah. ten different heavily peated whiskies that were out there. Um, we completely blind, even, even I think, I, I don't think I didn't, if I didn't, if I remember correctly, neither of us knew which one was the Kilkerran. We knew there was a Kilkerran in there, uh, but we got someone from the office to do the pouring, so we didn't know. And, and a blind tasting, completely natural, no bias or anything, the two and a half year old Kilkerran spirit was, I think, the second favourite in the tasting. So these were nine other commercially available single malts and one two and a half year old that you know we had no plans for. So that gave us a, a bit more confidence that it was as good as we thought it was. But there's always the danger 
or the possibility that subconsciously you recognise it as one of your own products because it's got a little bit, it, despite being really peaty, it's still got a Kilkerran characteristic to it. And so, yeah, we all loved it as a group, as a team, but what would people think of it? So we started dropping into tastings or sneaking a wee sample out here and there, and the, and the feedback was universally positive. So we decided then that we would start bottling the heavily peated Kilkerran um, on a similar basis, maybe not exactly the same, but a similar basis to what we did with the regular Kilkerran, the Work in Progress series, where we started bottling it as a five-year-old and let it mature a year at a time. So we thought we'd do something similar, and so we call it Peat in Progress, because we're not massively imaginative on the market inside at the moment. But uh, we went for Peat in Progress, so we started with a three-year-old, uh, and you know, every the, some of the whiskey in there gets a bit older every time we bottle it. Um, and so this is now batch number three, uh, which was released a few weeks ago. Um, might not be the easiest to find because it has proven to be massively popular. But Task Strength, it's a heavily peated whiskey. There's whiskey kind of from three, four, are we at five years old yet in there, nearly? Yeah, 15 was the first. So yeah, four and a half yeah. to five years old in here. Um, and if you like peated whiskey, or you, you probably need to like peated whiskey to like this one it's a proper peat monster. Um, the peat's there, it's massive, it slaps you about the face, it does all that kind of stuff. But then there is a little bit of that Kilkerran characteristic in there as well. No, definitely. I think, um, you know, the danger always with something that's really heavily peated is that becomes the dominating component of the mm. whiskey and it doesn't become anything more than that. And so the background part of it, you know, the, the work you put in to make sure the new make spirit's good, that you pick the right casks, you've got the right recipe, is in danger sometimes of being lost if mm. you focus too much on the peat. But I think through the various tastings and um, kind of meetings we've had talking about it, yeah, you know, the peat is a given, but we will quite often look at other components of it and talk about them because you can mm. taste them through the peat. Uh, it's not yeah. as if the peat is just completely demolishing your palate and, and that's the only thing you can really taste. I always feel that there's a really nice kind of sweet creaminess um, mm. to all the batches that we've done so far, which is really refreshing to try. And I think it's maybe one of the first things that sold us. I'm thinking that this could be uh, a whiskey we can start to, to roll out to people to get their thoughts on at as young an age as we did. Yeah. It's, it's interesting as well. I mean, this is relatively young. It's very peaty. It's cask strength and 50, 59.7%, you know. So we're not holding anything back <laughs> you're, you know you're getting the full experience um but it's not aggressive i think is maybe the best word i can find for it it's pt it's got that sweetness that creaminess um but nothing to again a whiskey of this age you'd expect there to be a bit of heat a bit of youthfulness a bit i always kind of like feel that new make spirit has got kind of a a, a sapling kind of quality to it, like a, a, a kind of budding branch of a tree, that kind of wee green sapling. I think there's a kind of greenness to it, if you can say that. But I don't find that in any of the heavily peated Kilkerrans we've done. And yeah, to an extent, the peat helps to cover that, I suppose you could say. But there's so much more that, that sweet creaminess, that American cream soda kind of character. And it can't even cast strength. I mean, I've added a wee splash of water now, but at cash strength, that, that's it's mental how drinkable that is. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things we picked up on right from the start, that even when we were trying it at that high strength, if you'd ask people to give a guess at what strength they thought that was, nobody would have got close to the 60% mm. or whatever it was we were trying it at. It tastes a much more kind of refined, um, kind of lower strength whiskey, and, mm. and in the best possible way. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's, a, it's an interesting addition to the Kilkerran range, you know, it's... Um, it's pretty different, but it's it's none the worse for it. And yeah, you know, eventually Pete and Progress will have progressed and we'll decide to do a kind of regular bottling of it. But we don't know when that's going to be because like us, you're trying it as it ages and you never, I, I, I believe you never ever know when a whiskey is perfect until it's not perfect anymore. So, you know, if, if it's getting better, 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 there must be a peak where it starts to get not better anymore. But you don't know that until you're past it. So we, we'll keep bottling versions of this until it um, 
until we decide it's not as good as the previous version was, I suppose, and that's when it'll it'll come out. And yeah, then we'll age some on and see how it goes and all the rest of it. It's that blank canvas thing again, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I mean, th this experiment has worked as well as we could ever have hoped it would, I think. You know, we didn't really know what we were getting into, trying to make it really peaty. The first batches of this stuff, or the first distillations of the heavily peated, were all made from malt, dist uh, malted at Springbank. And we didn't know how peaty we could make it. We know how we make long row, um, and it it kind of grew from there. But yeah, it's it's gone really well. I'm also aware we may be approaching a time limit. Would that be correct? Judging by the way Nathan's staring at me, as if to say, "Stop, stop talking, shut up." Um, so we'll we'll probably call the the session quits at this point. Um, to those of you who tuned in, thank you very much. Hope you you got something from it. Hope you discovered. Some things you maybe didn't know or reaffirmed some things you already believed. Um, but yeah, cheers. Thank no, you. Thanks very much. Cheers. <laughs>